Good afternoon, class. I'm Mr. Priscilla, and today we're going to be looking at a, a fun assignment, zeros of polynomials. And I think we should start off with some terminology just to make sure that we're all using the same terminology with regards to division. Uh, let's see. There are several different ways of expressing division. One way is just the little division symbol that you saw in, uh, I guess, elementary school. Uh, uh, the dividend divided by the divisor equals, what's the answer to a division problem? Starts with the Q. Quotient, okay, so that's the terminology we'll be using. And if the division uh, problem is written using that little dash with a dot above and below, then the thing that follows that division symbol is the divisor. If the division is represented using a fraction bar, remember a fraction bar, is another way of uh, representing a, the operation of division. The thing that's on top, the dividend, I guess in terms of fraction speak, we would say the numerator. And I think I forgot to turn on my microphone. Da -da -da. There. Is it on now? Yes. Yes. I did open enough panels over there. I can't see over there. Can you all hear me in the peanut gallery? I think there's two people over there. Can you hear me? Yes, no. <laughs> Is it working over here? Yes. Oh, I should have opened more panels. I was feeling lazy today. Okay. So the top thing is the dividend. The bottom, that's the divisor. And the answer to the division is the quotient. And, you know, there's another form of, uh, there's another representation for division that you would have seen with polynomial long division. You would have used the little division symbol like that. And this thing here, the thing under, under the division symbol is the dividend, the thing that's being divided. The thing doing the divide, uh, dividing, the thing on the outside is the divisor, and the quotient is what you get up on top. And I have, I have a picture of polynomial long division to help you all sit, remind you all of what we're looking at here. Do I remember ever seeing this stuff? I know you all did polynomial long division somewhere in previous math classes. Fortunately, you're not going to have to do polynomial long division today. We're going to see a shortcut for this process. And when, you're, uh, when we're using that little division symbol, as I said, the top thing is the quotient. Maybe I should make a note that the remainder is the thing that's down there at the very bottom. So down here, once you go through all that stuff, the remainder is what we have left over. So let's see. So there's three general ways of expressing division. The little dash with the dot above and below, the fraction bar, or the old-fashioned long division symbol. There's something called synthetic division. And what we're trying to do with synthetic division, we want to avoid this all of this messy process here the polynomial long division. We're trying to get around doing that. And there is a very nice method of performing the division, provided the divisor is in the form variable, plus or minus a number. And in this case, the divisor is x minus 1. So we could have used polynomial long, I mean, synthetic division on this thing here. But, oh, let's see. We don't need that anymore. I don't see. And synthetic division uh, 
It's a shortcut for polynomial long division. But the divisor has to be in the form variable plus or minus some number. So I'll say, but divisor must be in the form x plus or minus some constant. And instead of using a c, for some reason, they use a k. So I use a constant k. And I think the best way to see synthetic division is just to look at an example. So I want to start off with number four. Yeah, I'm jumping around a little bit here. Okay. Oh, where's my... There he is. And I want to start at number four. Let me write this problem down. This is number four. We have 5x to the fourth minus 29x cubed plus 21x squared minus 7x plus 10 divided by x minus 5. Make sure I did not miscopy this. 5x to the fourth minus 29x cubed plus 21x squared minus 7x plus 10 all divided by x minus 5 I look here and I notice my divisor is in the correct form so what I do is I determine something I call the k value the k value is exactly the opposite of what the number you see in the divisor. I see a minus 5 there, so the k value is a positive 5. Now put a little hook there. And the dividend needs to be in descending order based on powers. So the biggest exponent up top is x to the fourth. So I'm going to have to have an x to the fourth column, and then an x cubed, an x squared, an x, and a constant. Now, underneath where I have those little variables, the column headings, write the coefficients. The coefficient for x to the fourth is 5, and then a negative 29, that's a positive 21, a negative 7, and a positive 10. To get the process started, whatever that leading coefficient is there, you bring it down. So you skip a line. I'm going to draw a line here, okay? So I'm skipping a line. And underneath that line I just drew, I bring down the leading coefficient. We'll discuss why we do that in a moment. And then you get started. You take that number down there under the line times the k value. 5 times 5, that's a positive 25. Negative 29 plus 25 gives us a negative 4. And then you repeat the process. Negative 4 times positive 5 is a negative 20. 21 minus 20, that's a positive 1. Once you get the line down here, I mean, once you get the number down here, you multiply by the k value. 1 times 5 is a positive 5. Negative 7 plus 5 gives us a negative 2. Let me keep on going. Negative 2 times positive 5 
gives us a negative 10. 10 minus 10 gives me a zero. This last number is the remainder. So, in this case, we have a remainder of zero. That means x minus 5 divides evenly into the uh, dividend. Now, let's stop and think. We start off, our dividend is a five, starts off with a 5x to the fourth. The divisor is just an x, and in order to use synthetic division, that divisor always has to be just the variable. So let's see, whatever that, whatever that leading variable power is, x to the fourth, is always going to be underneath, divided by a single x, so we can cancel an x above and below. That leaves us with a 5x cubed. So the first term in the quotient, that 5 right there is the coefficient for x cubed. The leading variable uh, part will be one power less than the biggest power in the dividend. It started off with an x to the fourth. You divided it by an x, so you had a 5x cubed. Now you decrease by 1, so the next term, minus 4x squared plus 1x minus 2. So my quotient is 5x cubed minus 4x squared plus x minus 2. The remainder was 0, so we don't have to worry about that. Any questions there? It's one less than the largest power in the dividend. You had a 5x to the fourth, and it's being divided by an x. You can cancel one x above and below, so instead of having four x's up there, you only have three. That will always be the pattern for synthetic division. That variable part is one less than the largest variable part in the dividend. Let's type that answer in. Five x cubed. Get out of the exponent before we type the four x square plus x minus two. And I use the phrase divides evenly uh, frequently. So let's make sure we all agree with what I mean by divides evenly. I say two goes into uh, two divides evenly into eight because it goes in four times. Oh wait a minute, I can't see what I'm writing here. Eight divided by two is four with the remainder zero. So 2 divides evenly into 8. Likewise, x minus 5 divides evenly into the dividend. Divides evenly means means the remainder is equal to 0. So think about what we have with the, uh, the division algorithm. Dividend divided by divisor equals quotient. That means that the quotient times the divisor would have to give you that dividend. So if you took x minus 5 and you multiplied it by 5x cubed minus 4x squared plus x minus 2, you would get back that big messy polynomial 5x to the fourth minus 29x cubed and so forth. Any questions there? Let's see, let's go back to number one. Okay, so the representing the division here with the fraction bar, is that what they're going to use in number one? No, they're using the old-fashioned little dash with a dot above and below it. Use synthetic division. First of all, if we're using synthetic division, 
The divisor better be in the form variable plus or minus a number. Is it? Yes, yes it is. So, yes, we can use synthetic division. Let me write this down. It's number one. We have an s cubed minus 7s squared plus 24s minus 9 divided by the divisor is s minus 4. Let me make sure that this copy. Okay, you'll notice the divisor is in the format that we need, and we can determine our k value. In this case, k is equal to 4. four. Here's something, uh, I say you just change the sign on that number. Technically, what you're doing is you're asking yourself, what number would make this uh, s minus 4 equal to 0? What number would make s minus 4 equal to 0? a positive 4. That's why you're changing that number. You're technically, you're asking yourself, what number makes the divisor equal to 0? So for our purposes, it's just the opposite of what you see there in the dividend. We have k equals 4, and then our largest variable, we have an s cubed, an s squared, an s, and a constant. Hey, what's the coefficient of x cubed? What am I going to write right here? One. One. Now, uh, once you start off with an s cubed, suppose there wasn't an x s squared, you have to have a column for s squared, so you'd have to use a zero as the placeholder if the variable were completely, if the term were completely missing. Whatever you start off with, the biggest one, you have to then start decreasing. You started with an s cubed, so you need a column for s squared, s, and a constant. And if a term is skipped, you assume a zero. Then here, s squared, that's a negative 7, a positive 24. And what do I have as my constant? Negative 9. Skip a line. You start the process by bringing down the leading coefficient. You bring down the 1. Then you start multiplying. 4 times 1 is a positive 4. Negative 7 plus 4 is a negative 3. Negative 3 times 4 is a negative 12. 24 minus 12 gives us a positive 12. 12 times 4 is a positive 48. Okay. Negative 9 plus 48 is going to give me a positive, that's a positive 39. Our first question, does S minus 4 divide evenly into the dividend? No, what's the remainder? 39, so, well, what's the variable part to this first term here in my quotient? So it's one less than what you started with, so s squared, s, and then a constant. So my quotient is 1s squared minus 3s plus 12, and the remainder is a positive 39. There's a variety of ways to express that remainder. I think what they're using here is they're using the, just say an R39. Let's check. Yep, they're saying the remain, they're using a capital R. Well, I use a lowercase r. R is positive 39. This is nice. We don't have to type in anything. A, B, C, or D. A, I agree. Any questions there? Okay. Hmm. Now, I want you.
you to consider, y'all know that if the time ever comes when I rule the world, I, I think the first law that I'll pass will be, you have to use x as a variable if it's a, a algebra of a single variable. You have to avoid those tails like y's and p's and q's. But one of the things, no s's. They look too much like fives. Okay, and uh, but so I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of use this problem here, but I'm gonna change the variable. Let's consider the function f of x equals x cubed minus seven x squared plus twenty four times x minus nine. That's a messy three there, isn't it? There. Oh, thank you for reminding me. Switch this. X cubed minus 7x squared plus 24x minus 9. Suppose I wanted you to find f of 4. I want you to find f of 4. We know how function notation works. Let's say and go to your function f, and wherever you see a variable, plug in what? 4, okay. So we're going to come over here, and everywhere we see a variable, we're going to plug in a 4. And 4 cubed is 64 minus 7 times 4 squared is 60. Okay, where's my calculator? Let's see, where's my calculator? There it is. Okay, so we have 4 cubed minus 7 times 4 squared plus 24 times 4 and a minus 9. That gives us 39. Wait a minute, I saw 39 a moment ago somewhere. Where did I see the number 39? Right here in the remainder? That's not a coincidence. If you evaluate the dividend at whatever the k value is, it's going to give you the value of the remainder. There. That's called the remainder theorem. If you have some polynomial function and you evaluate it at k, then the value of that function is the same thing as the remainder. This factor, this is called the, uh, pardon me, it's called the remainder theorem, and it used to be extremely important because look at what we had to do here to evaluate this uh, function just at 4. Well, 4 cubed, I could do that in my head, that was 64. 4 squared is 16 times 7. That's becoming a hassle. 24 times 4, that's 96. That's not too bad. But think back to before calculators. If you look in real old algebra textbooks, there'll be times where all of a sudden you'll see synthetic division algorithms set up. They're trying to evaluate some messy function. And to get around having to do all that exponentiation, think about this before calculators. Suppose you need to plug in 17 rather than 4. 17 cubed minus 7 times 17 squared plus 24 times 17 minus 9. Imagine doing all that stuff by hand. It was a hassle. Now, look at this little uh, synthetic uh, division algorithm. When you're using the synthetic division algorithm, there's no exponentiation. We didn't have to take the 4 and cube it. All it is is multiplication and addition and subtraction. That's it. And so from, uh, in a, from an old world point of view, 
This remainder theorem really helped people perform the messy arithmetic that avoided those expo uh, exponents, what have you. Now, in today's modern days, I can't imagine someone deciding, oh, I need to evaluate a function at this number. Let me draw out my little synthetic division algorithm. I think most people would do what I did right here, don't you think? Using a calculator? I think so. But there, it is, uh, it, it's, it's listed as one of the student learning outcomes for this course. When the state set up the, uh, the student learning outcomes, they went through and did it for every tax-funded course. And I was surprised when the remainder theorem was mentioned by name in the list of student learning outcomes for uh, college algebra, because it's really not that uh, significant. But if you think about it, I tell students this every semester, if you think about it, the people that were sitting there, the people in Austin, they may not know that much algebra, and if they took algebra, they probably forgot a lot of it. They're sitting there, sitting around a table. Well, what do the students need to know when they're in, uh, when they finish their college algebra class? Someone saw the phrase remainder theorem, and they thought, hey, dividing, yeah, they need to know how to divide. And so that's how that remainder got, theorem got mentioned there. There's something called the fundamental theorem of algebra. The fundamental theorem of algebra. That seems pretty important, doesn't it? To be called the fundamental theorem of algebra? Did they mention that by name? Mm -mm, they didn't. The remainder theorem was mentioned by name. So there it is. If you... Take that k value that you use with synthetic division and plug it into the dividend, you're going to get that remainder. Hey, let's look back at the problem we did over here, this number four. Let's suppose I took five and I plugged it in all the way across the top. What would it equal? If I plugged in a five all the way across the top, it would equal zero. The remainder is zero. Let's do the, there's a remainder theorem problem here in the homework. So I think it's number five. Let me get rid of this calculator. Number five. Use the remainder theorem in synthetic division to find f of k for the given value of k. Now, if you were, uh, and when you're at home doing your homework, if you're like, I'm not going to draw out that little synthetic division algorithm, and you just type it into your calculator the way I did that other one. Am I going to know it? Will my lab know it? No. No, they won't know. So it doesn't really matter if that's what you do. But it is from a historic point of view, it is interesting. Negative x cubed minus 5x squared minus 6x plus 3. And they give us a, cal a k value of negative 3. Let me make sure I didn't miscopy something. Okay. And they want us to use synthetic division. Here they're telling us the k value. In a little bit, they'll be giving you the k value, and you'll have to go back to the divisor. And so remember... Whatever the k value is, is exactly the opposite of what you see in the divisor. So the k value is a negative 3. What's the divisor that you're using? It'd be x plus 3. Okay, so there's the divisor. We're really dividing. We're dividing f of x by x plus 3. Let's get the, uh, let's set up the synthetic division algorithm. Our k value is negative 3. We have an x cubed, an x squared, an x, and a constant. Y'all call out the numbers going across here. Negative 1 here. I agree. Here. And... What do we do now? Okay, bring down the negative one. Then 
Negative 3 times negative 1 gives me a positive 3. Negative 5 plus 3 gives me a negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 3 gives us a positive 6. Negative 6 plus 6 gives me a 0. 0 times negative 3 is 0. And what's my remainder? 3. That means if I plugged negative 3 into this function for x, I should expect it to equal positive 3. Any questions there? But hopefully you see from an arithmetic point of view, here you're not cubing anything. There's no exponentiation as you go through all of this. It's strictly multiplication and addition, and it's multiplication that you can do in your head, back before calculators, to be able to do something like this, this evaluate it without having to deal with that exponentiation. It sort of was a big deal. And before you say anything, I've always had calculators in my math class. I'm not that old, okay, but, but if you look back in real old books, you'll see, real old math books, you'll see that this sort of was a big deal, the way they could evaluate the uh, function without plugging in the actual numbers and doing the exponentiation. Any questions there? Okay. I have some writing I need to do. Definition. K is a zero. It's also called root. It used to be called root. K is a zero of a polynomial function. I'll just say K is a zero of P of X, P for polynomial, if and only if P of K is equal to zero. Back in the olden days when I was in college, we called them roots. But somewhere in the 90s, it seemed like all the books switched over and started using the terminology zero, and I sort of agree with it, because mathematically, if you hear the word root, I don't know about you, but I start thinking of radicals and square roots and cube roots. This has nothing to do with radicals, okay? So a zero is a number that you can plug into a polynomial function to make the function equal zero. I think we've already found a zero, haven't we? Look back at number four, that first problem we did. The remainder was zero. That means if you plug five into this stuff up here, it gave you zero. So we could say that five is a zero. You all follow my logic there? Using the remainder theorem, if we plug 5 into that dividend, we'd get 0. So 5 is a 0 of that dividend. Is negative 3 a 0 with this function? No, because if we plug negative 3 into that function, you're not going to get 0. You're going to get 3. Okay. There's something called the factor theorem. If x minus k, 
I think I'm going to mark that out. I'm going to say, it. I'm going to make a stronger statement. X minus K is a factor if and only if K is a zero. Remember, a factor is something that divides in evenly. 2 is a factor of 8 because 2 divides evenly into 8. The remainder is 0. What I was trying to say earlier, what you see inside the divisor or the factor, what you see is exactly the opposite of, a, uh, of the k value. So, for example, let's say if k equals negative 7 is a 0, then what's the corresponding factor? If negative 7 is a 0, what's the corresponding factor? It has to be something that when you plug in negative 7, you get 0. It's more than 7. It is the variable plus 7. So if k equals negative 7 is a 0, x plus 7, I didn't finish what I was writing, is a factor. The factor has exactly, the constant term in the factor is exactly the opposite of the k value. Any questions there? What we're trying to do, what we're working towards, is factoring higher order polynomials. We've been factoring uh, quadratics. That's what we've had to factor so much. Quadratics, well, suppose it was something that wasn't a quadratic. Suppose it was a cubic. Let's look at number six. Suppose you had the cubic, there's the function, 3x cubed plus 11x squared minus 19x plus 5. That's what we want to factor. Hopefully you'll agree we haven't factored anything like this, uh, this semester. Everything we had, we factored, has had x squares, not x cubes. How do you factor higher order polynomials? That's where zeros and synthetic division come into play. So I'll say our goal, our goal is to factor higher order polynomials. Factor with but instead of saying higher order, I'll explain what I mean like that. We were trying to factor polynomials with x cubes or x to the fourths, etc. Recall the division algorithm. I'm going to go back to that 8 divided by 2 is 4. We say 4 is the quotient, 2 is the uh, divisor. 8 divided by 2 is equal to 4. Why? Because the quotient times the divisor has to give you the dividend. 4 times 2 has to give you 8. And that's, an, uh, that's a specific case of the division algorithm. Generally, if you have a dividend divided by divisor equals quotient, that means, remember, before you learned division, you learned multiplication. That's how division was defined. This answer here times the divisor gives you the dividend. So I'll write it. That, uh, that means that the dividend is equal to the divisor times the quotient.
any questions on my logic. You may not see where I'm going, but hopefully you're following my logic. The divisor times the quotient gives the dividend. So, looking at number six, I'm going to need a home page for this. Not that it's that long, but I don't want to be stuck down there at the bottom of the page. We want to factor f of x equals 3x cubed plus 11x squared minus 19x plus 5. And they gave us one little piece of information. They tell us that k equals 1 is a 0. k equals 1 is a 0. I'm just making sure I haven't miscopied it because if I've miscopied anything then. I'm going to get a very wrong answer there. Hey, if k equals 1 is a 0, what's the divisor? Think about what we're going to want. We want our answer. Our answer is going to be a factored form, f of x equals. And notice they say in the instructions, they say to factor it, but they're saying more than that. They're saying to factor it into linear factors. That means the parentheses should only have x's. That's what a linear factor is. So we're going to factor this thing so that it just has uh, so that it has a uh, parentheses containing just the variable x, not a power on the x. Tell me one of the factors. I know one of the factors. K equals one is a zero, according to the factor theorem. If k is a 0, x minus k has to be a factor. So what's the factor associated with that k equals 1? It's, it's going to be in terms of x. You, oh, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me. There. What's the factor associated with k equals 1? I'll get us started. It's, the variable is x minus one. minus 1. We want it in linear factors. That means just x's. In order to get an x cubed, we need an x, an x, and an x. So we're going to need two other sets of parentheses. That's what we're looking for, are those two other sets of parentheses. The first factor came about from the zero. It's variable and then the opposite of the k value. Now let's use synthetic division. We know that k is equal to 1. We have a start off with an x cubed, and then we have to have an x squared, an x, and a constant. The coefficients going across here, 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 and here. Good. Draw, skip a line and, and draw your line to get the process started. I bring down that three times one is a positive 3. 11 plus 3, that's a positive 14. 14 times 1 is another positive 14. Negative 19 plus 14 is a negative 5. What am I going to have here? Negative 5 times 1, I agree, is a negative 5. What are we getting as the remainder? And that's not surprising. It has to be zero because if k is a zero, that means when you plug in across there, you get zero. 
when you simplify and remember the value of the function equals the remainder. So that's not surprising. When we said k equals 1 is a 0, we knew the remainder would be 0. So what's the variable part on this 3 here? x squared and then x. So we don't have the thing factored as linear factors yet, but what we do have, we know that the original function f of x has to equal that first factor, x minus 1, the divisor, and here's the quotient, 3x squared plus 14x minus 5. Divisor times quotient should give you the dividend, that function that we're trying to factor. Any questions on my logic there? X minus 1 times this stuff here will give us back that third degree polynomial. But they want it in linear factors. So this is not the answer they want. This isn't linear, it's quadratic. But we know how to factor this quadratic expression. Let's write my two sets of parentheses. 3x squared. What times what will give us 3? There's 1 times 3, so I'm going to say 1x times 3x. Uh-oh, the last sign's a minus. What does that mean? We're going to have one of each. We'll have 1 plus and one minus. Now for five, that's easy. There's only one possibility there. One times five. So play it out in your head. Where should we put the one? Where should we put the five? We're trying to get back a, okay? I think we need that five to be multiplied by the three. So the five there, the one there. And what about the signs? Remember, we need the outer and the inner to give us a positive 14. So x plus 5 in, 3x. There it is. So our first divisor, our first factor was x minus 1. That was the divisor. Times x plus 5 times 3x minus 1. If we sat down and foiled out x minus 1 times x plus 5, combined our like terms, then took 3x, distributed over all of that, took negative 1, distributed over all of that, combined like terms, what would we get back? 3x cubed plus 11x squared minus 19x plus 5. We have just now factored a third degree polynomial. So we come over here. They want us to factor it. So x minus 1 and then x. As long as you have the same thing inside the parentheses, the order of the parentheses doesn't matter. If you wanted to type uh, 3x minus 1 before the x plus 5, you could. The factor that we get from the uh, 0, from the k value, that's always the first one I write. That's just my habit. The factor that comes from that k value, that's the first one I put in my answer. But there's nothing, you know, magical about the order. As long as you have all three same sets of parentheses, your answer is correct. Any questions there? This is really amazing. We can factor. We now have a general process we can use to factor any sort of, even if it were an x to the fourth or an x to the fifth, it'd probably take more, it'd take me uh, more rounds of uh, synthetic division, but we have a process that we can uh, used to factor these higher order polynomials. There's one huge drawback to this method. There's one drawback to this method. What is it? You have to know a zero. It only works if you know a zero. Well, we'll have a way of determining zeros before the end of class.
or I should say possible zeros. Here's number seven. Let's do this one. I always got nervous as a student when the teacher started getting excited about stuff. Uh-oh, what's going on here? In the old-fashioned Mission Impossibles, I remember the producer back in the 60s. I've read years later that the producer believed those agents should just be as close to machines as possible. They never got excited. You never saw them at the end of one of their impossible missions. Just carry, well, one time you did, okay? And the second two-hour uh, two uh, show, they were laughing and carrying on at the end. But otherwise, he thought you never get excited. And I try not to get excited because I know that can make people sort of nervous. Oh, this teacher's getting excited about this stuff. What's next? But this is one of my favorite things to teach. I seem to say that a lot, don't I? That just means I like my job. Negative two is the zero. I better write this down. And before we even do this, there's something else I want to point out. We know that one is a zero. If you plug in one, one minus one, that makes the function equal zero. We can find the remaining zeros. There are other numbers that you can plug in here that make it equal zero. Well, a product is equal to zero when one or more of its factors equals zero. We know x equals one is a zero. What's another zero for this function here? When does x plus five equal zero? At negative five. Okay, so we found two zeros. What about three x minus one? When does it equal zero? Move the one over, divide by three. What's the third zero? maybe one third. Once you have the thing factored, you can determine the other zeros. One, negative five, and positive one third. So it's even more amazing. Not only are we able to factor it, once we have it factored, we can determine all of the uh, zeros. There's something called the fundamental theorem of algebra, and it wasn't listed by name as a, a student learning outcome for this course, but I think it's significant. The, the For our point of view, I'm going to uh, uh, roughly state that fundamental theorem of algebra. The fundamental theorem of algebra says that the number of zeros a polynomial function has cannot be more than the largest exponent. This thing right here, three, you can't have more than three zeros. And yeah, we have three zeros, one, negative five, and positive one third. When I look at this one here, there can't be more than three zeros. You say, well, don't you mean there's going to have to be exactly three zeros to get an x cubed? We need an x, x, x. No, there could be fewer. Suppose we've gotten another x plus five. Suppose it had x plus five, x plus five. Then the zeros would have just been one and negative five. If you have repeated factors, then you wouldn't pick up an extra zero. But generally speaking, the number of zeros cannot exceed the biggest exponent in the function. So I found three zeros. I know that's it. There are no other numbers we can plug in up here to make that function equal zero. The only numbers you can plug in are one, negative five, and positive one third. This one here, there are at most three zeros. Well, let's get started. And I'm going to do what I did up here. I'm going to write out, this is where I'm going to write my answer. F of x equals I need the factored form. Since it's another x cubed, only three sets of parentheses in my final answer. What's the first factor I'm going to have here? It comes about from the k value. x plus 2. Good. So the question is, what's going to go in those other parentheses? To determine that, we set up our synthetic division algorithm. That's a negative 2. We have an x cubed, an x squared, an x, and a constant. 
Let's fill in the numbers going across. Here. Okay, here. Here. And. Okay. And I skip a line. Here. Here. Three times negative two. I agree with the negative six. Down here. Okay, 1 minus 6, that's a positive 5. Here, uh, 5 times negative 2, I'm getting a negative 10. Negative 10. Negative 10. Negative 10. Okay, we've messed up somewhere. Three it's negative more. 5. Oh, it's a negative 5. Thank you. That is a negative 5. 1 minus 6 is a negative 5. Negative five. Now, how did I know we messed up? What does the remainder have to be? K is a zero, so the remainder has to be zero. And as I was getting that negative 18 here, I knew, well, that's not going to give me a zero, because negative 18 times negative 2 is giving me a 36. I was getting a remainder of 40. So I knew I messed up. Keep in mind that remainder has to be zero. But Negative 2 times negative 5 gives me a positive 10. What do I have here? A positive 2 here. Positive 2 times negative 2, sure enough, that gives me a negative 4. So what's my quotient? 3, what have I got beside the 3? x squared minus 5 plus 2. So, and once again, that remainder being zero, we knew it had to be a zero because they told us that negative two is a zero. So at this point, we have x plus two, that's the first factor, that's our divisor, times the dividend, I mean times the quotient, three x squared minus five x plus two. We want linear factors. Realize, sometimes you may not be able to get linear factors. Suppose we had wound up with an x squared plus x plus 5, something that wasn't factorable here. Well, then it's factored as a linear and a quadratic factor. But these problems will be uh, uh, made so that the resulting trinomial is factorable. Let's try factoring that. 3x squared minus 5x plus 2. It's just a coincidence that the first term is another 3x squared. What times what's going to give us 3x squared? Okay, so 1x times 3x. Hey, we know something nice about the signs. What do we know? I couldn't hear you. Okay, the last sign's a plus, so they're both negative. And then 2, there's only one uh, pair of positive integers, 1 times 2. Play it out in your head. In order to get back that negative 5x, what needs to go after the x minus, the 1 or the 2? I agree. The 1 goes there, the 2 goes there. And if you check, the outer product is a negative 2x. The inner product is a negative 3x. Negative 2x minus 3x gives me a negative 5x. Is that what we needed? Yes, it is. So my other factors are x minus 1 and 3x minus 2. Suppose the instructions, instead of them telling us to factor the thing, suppose they told us to find the zeros. You would have still had to go through all of this, but now you go through setting each factor equal to zero. Even though they didn't ask us, we know negative 2 is a zero. Negative 2. Give me another zero. Give me a number we can plug in for x that would make all of that equal zero positive 1, and 2 thirds. Is it possible there are other zeros that we haven't found? 
The largest exponent is a 3. We have three zeros. There cannot be more. The number of zeros cannot exceed that largest exponent. So no, there are all the zeros. Number of factors. Now, the order in which you're typing in the factors doesn't matter. I like to put the one associated with the k value first, x plus 2. You have an x minus 1 and a 3x minus 2. Any questions? But hopefully you see, there'd be a problem. Suppose they, had, suppose they just said back to this thing. You have to know a zero to get started. You have to know a zero in order to start using that synthetic division. So if they didn't tell us a zero, we'd have problems. Because, well, I guess you could just start guessing. Well, let's try 10. Let's try four. You can just start randomly guessing numbers. Just if you plug in 10, do you get a zero? No. What about two? Does two give you a zero? No, it would come close, I suppose. But this is requiring that we know a zero. That's sort of a problem, but not really. You'll see what I mean by the end of class. Number eight. Same instructions. We're trying to factor f of x equals 4x cubed plus 15x squared minus 24x plus 5. And they tell us that k equals negative 5 Oh, this isn't number five, this is number eight. Where did I get a five from? K equals negative five is a zero. I know my answer is going to look like f of x equals, I know, three sets of parentheses. What's the first factor I'm going to write here? x plus 5. X plus five. It's the variable and then the opposite of the k value. And the reason it's an opposite is because if you plug that number in, it has to give you zero. Negative 5 plus 5 is zero. Zero times that stuff equals zero. Now we'll use synthetic division with our k value of negative 5. x cubed, x squared, x constant. Oh, call out the numbers going across the top here. Here. And skip a line here. That looks like a point four. That's just where I accidentally touched the page. That is not a point. Y'all want me to mark that out, or should I not mark it out? If I mark it out, it'll make it even a bigger smudge. Y'all know that's a four. Oh, I, I put another thing. What do I put here? Here, 15 minus 20 gives me, negative 5 times negative 5 gives me, here, that's a positive 1, here, a negative 5, and here, and that's not a surprise. If it weren't zero, then we've done something wrong because they told us 
that negative 5 is a 0, so the remainder should be a 0. Variable part here. So we need to factor 4x squared minus 5x plus 1. Let's see, I'll write my two sets of parentheses. I'll make it a little shorter. You'll notice I'm not writing it out like that. I'm just saying let's factor that trinomial. Oh, well, I know we're going to need an x and an x. And, hey, I know... Uh, uh, I'm going to ignore that 4 for the time being. Last sign's a plus, so what do I know about the signs? Both negative. And what times what gives us 1? What's going to go here and here? A 1, that's that 1 right there. The only possibility is a 1. So the question is, are we going to use 2 times 2 or 1 times 4. If you try 2 and 2, you can pretty uh, quickly convince yourself that it's going to give you a 4x right there, not that minus 5x that you need. So we're going to need a 1 and a 4. I'll use the 1 there and the 4 there. Does that give us back the minus 5x that we need? What's the outer product? One x times a negative one is a negative one x. What's the inner product? Negative one minus four gives me a negative five. Is that what I needed? Yes. Yes, it is. So what do I put inside those other parentheses? I have an x minus one and a four x minus one. The old algebra book used to have uh, the problems that then said, what are the zeros? We know negative 5 is a 0. Oh, that's just my scratch work there. If they asked for the zeros, we know negative 5 is 1. What are the other two? Positive 1. Positive 1. I agree. And... 1 over 4. So if they'd asked for the uh, other zeros, here they are. But this is what they're looking for, the factorization. here, the number 8, and as I said, the order in which you write those factors doesn't matter. I like to put the x plus 5 first, the one associated with the 0, but if you did this, x minus 1 and 4x minus 1, and then finally, suppose you put the x plus 5 at the end, you should still get the correct answer. Any questions there? I said that having to, in order to use this factoring process, you have to know a zero. And if you don't know a zero, are you going to have to figure out one? Well, how do you figure out one? Just looking at this thing. Well, I guess you could just start randomly choosing numbers. Well, maybe if I plug in 3, it'll equal 0. Maybe if I plug in negative 7, it'll give me 0. But you have to know a 0 before you can factor these higher order uh, polynomials. There's something called the rational, I'm going to call it the rational root test, as I think I mentioned when I was in school, they call these things uh, roots. Now they call them zeros, so I'm going to call it the rational zeros. The rational zeros test.
What the rational zeros theorem does is it gives you a finite list of numbers that might make the function equal zero. It doesn't tell you exactly which ones do it, but instead of infinitely many numbers, there are infinitely many numbers you can plug in for f of x here. How do you choose the ones that equal zero? What the rational zeros theorem does is it gives you a finite list of about 20 numbers that might make the function equal zero. So if you, they didn't tell you a zero, you'd have to apply the rational root, I mean the rational zeros test, and then you'll have this finite list of numbers. You can take the first one, plug it in. If it equals zero, use synthetic division. If it doesn't, go on to the next one. But this test will give you a finite list of possible zeros. I'll say any possible zeros of the polynomial function p of x must be in the form I'll say possible rational zeros They have to be in the form. Now, let's see. There's a plus minus on top. That number has to be a factor of the constant. The denominator has to be a factor of the leading coefficient. What the rational zeros theorem does is it gives us a finite list of possible zeros. Let's apply the rational zeros uh, test to that problem in number eight. Let's see, what, what were the possible, we know the zeros. The zeros are negative five of one and one fourth. But let's see what numbers were possibly zeros. I'm going to apply the rational zeros test to this problem number five. So, let me write that down. 4x squared plus 4x cubed plus 15x squared. Let's say minus 24x plus 5. The constant term is what we start with. Because the constant term is what we use for the numerator. So let's write out the factors of 5. This is pretty nice. The factors of 5 are just 1 and 5. And you say, well, negative 1 and times negative 5 gives you a positive 5. That's right. But the plus minus that we have here in front takes care of all the sign changes. So all you have to do is write out the positive integer factors of 5. That's what's going to be on top. Now on bottom, we need the factors of the leading coefficient. Factors of leading coefficient. So that's the factors of four. The leading coefficient is a four. Well, let's see, that would be one, what else? Two and, there's another one. 2 times 2 is 4, 1 times 4, okay. Now you need an organized fashion for writing out all the possibilities. What I'll do is 
I take the factors here, 1 and 5, put them over 1. Then I take 1 and 5, put them over 2. I take 1 and 5, put them over 4. I take every one of these top numbers and put them over every one of the bottom numbers. So I have a plus or minus, plus or minus 1 or 5. I put both of them over that green 1. Then I take 1 and 5 and put them over the green 2. And finally, I take 1 and 5 and put them over. We have two fractions left. 1 and 5 have to go over 4. Okay, just making sure y'all are following. Making sure someone's following. I guess you're someone's a flake. And that looks bad, but we can simplify these fractions. Like 1 over 1. That's 1. And you should be able to convince yourself that 1 will always be a factor of the constant, and it's going to be a factor of the leading coefficient. So positive or negative 1 is always a possible 0. And then 5 divided by 1, that reduces nicely just to 5. 1 over 2, that's 1 half. 5 over 2, 5 halves. 1 over 4, we can't reduce that, that's just 1 fourth. And 5 over 4, here are all of the possible rational zeros. Out of infinitely many numbers in all the world, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. There are 12 possible numbers that could possibly make the function equal 0. So if you don't have a zero, if you don't know a 0, get started. Start going through. Find a number here that makes that thing equal 0. As soon as you do, you can use a synthetic division. But these are the, pos the numbers that can possibly make the function equal 0. We call them our possible rational zeros, or PRR, possible rational zeros. That's what the rational root test does. It gives us a list of numbers that could possibly be zeros. So if you had some arbitrary polynomial that you needed to factor and they didn't tell you a zero, you come up with the factors of the constant, the factors of the leading coefficient, make the little fractions, and then get started. Does one make it equal zero? If so, then you, uh, great, use synthetic division. If not, go on to negative one. Now, we already know the zeros. We found these zeros. They were what? Negative five, one, and one-fourth. These numbers had better be in that little list of our hours, are they? Negative five, is it over here in the list? Yeah, it sure is. Positive 1, yeah, it's in the list. Positive 1 fourth, yep, it was in the list. Any questions there? Before we all start uh, dreading that we're going to have to now have a polynomial, apply the rational zeros theorem to get a list of possible rational zeros, then go through until you find one that is a zero, and then start using synthetic division. I'm going to do what Dr. Kirkendall, my esteemed former colleague, would do. He would say, okay, he'd show the students how to do the factorization once you know a zero, and he'd show the students a rational, uh, the rational zeros theorem, how you find numbers that are possibly rational zeros, so that you know if you ever ran into, say, some uh, someone came up with a polynomial that you needed to factor, you could put the pieces together. First of all, apply the rational zeros theorem, then find a number that makes the function equal zero, and then start applying synthetic division. But I'm not going to make y'all do everything all in one problem. Is that clear? You'll have to you have to be able to factor when I give you a zero. And there are some problems like, let's see, what's number nine? 
There's a problem, so they want you to find those rational zeros, like this one here, number nine. But notice how they're giving it to us as multiple choice, so you don't have to type in those things. That's pretty nice. Number nine. Of course, if you're one of those people that get confused and put the uh, flip the numerators and the denominators, one of these wrong answers is the is the uh, the uh, answers when they're the reciprocals of them. So it's not all fun and games and great because it's a uh, multiple choice. There are some tricky options there. Let's write this problem down. We want the possible rational zeros. And here's the function, p of x is equal to 2x cubed plus 7x squared plus 10x minus 8. Oh, hold on, let me do this. Ah, let me move this. We're still while well, this example is written here. Okay, here's this example. Suppose I change the problem. I'm going to change that 15x squared to a 45x squared. Okay, I change that to a 45x squared. I'm going to change this next term here from a minus 24x to a plus 24. Does that have any impact on the possible rational zeros? When you're looking at trying to determine that finite list of possible rational zeros, if I change this term and that term, have I changed the answer in any way? Do we use these numbers when determining this finite list? No, you don't. You're only using the constant and the leading coefficient. So those middle terms there, it doesn't matter. Only the constant and the leading coefficient. First thing we do is we need the constant. I mean, the factors, our constant is negative eight, but you don't have to worry about the signs. The plus minus possibility takes care of those signs. So for our purposes, all we need, let's start off with the factors of eight. There's one and eight. Are there any more? Two and four. Now we need the factors of the leading coefficient. What's the leading coefficient? Two. Two. So what's the factors of two? One and two. One and two. And you just need an organized way of, you have to take every number on top and put it over every number on the bottom. So you just need an organized fashion. What, uh, what my lab does when they're coming up with the possible answers, they take the one, they put it over, no, let's see. Yeah, they take the one, put it over the one, two. They take the two, put it over one, two. What I do, Usually there are more factors of the constant than the leading coefficient, and it's just the thing that's written first. So what I do is I take the one, two, four, eight, put it over one, the one, two, four, eight, put it over two. So I'm gonna put the one, two, four, eight. I have to put it over one. And remember I said one will always be a factor, so one and negative one will always be possible zeros. Then I take the one, two, four, eight and put them over. I take the one, two, four, eight and put them over. Two. 
okay, I take the, all those, those four factors, put them over the one, then I put them over two. And when we simplify, some of these we'll probably be able to discard. One divided by one, that's one. Two over one, two. Well, we can just drop the over ones, can't we? That's what I'm doing here, just going through dropping the over ones. Now, one over two, that's one half. We don't have one half listed yet, so let me write it down. What about two divided by two? One, we already have it, so I don't need to worry about that. What about four divided by two? Two. We already have that listed. Eight divided by two. Four. Look at this. Out of infinitely many numbers, there are only two, four, six, eight. There are only ten possible numbers that can make that function equal zero. So if we needed to factor it, I'd start off with positive one. If I plug in positive one, does it give me zero? If so, then use synthetic division. If not, go on to negative one. Plug it in, does that equal zero? If I needed to factor it, I'd just go through until I found one of these things that makes it equal zero. Now suppose none of these numbers make it equal zero, that means the polynomial then is prime. But if a number is going to make it equal zero, it has to be in this list. Any questions on our logic here? So let's come back over. As long as they have the 10 numbers listed, the order doesn't matter. So, oh, it's not A, it's not B, it's either C or D. Which one is it? And notice something, the way if you accidentally put the leading coefficient on top and the constant on the bottom, you would get the, here's the correct answer that we want, but if you had flipped the fractions accidentally, you'd get this answer right here. So make sure you remember the constant term is what goes on top. Any questions there? Let's do one more, y'all are so quiet. Let's do one more. This is number 11. Same instructions. Find all of the numbers that are possible, that could possibly be zeros of negative 2x to the fourth plus 4x cubed plus 5x squared plus 18. Okay, and there. The first thing I'm going to do is write out the factors of the factors of 18. I'll do that first. because that's what goes on top. That's the constant term. Well, it's 1 times 18. What else? 2 times 9. 2 times 9. And any more? 3 times 6. I agree. So that's the, those are the factors of the constant term. What about the factors of the lead coefficient? The factors of, and once again, you don't need to worry about that negative. The plus minus will take care of the sign changes. So all you need are the factors of two. And they are one and two. So, I'm going to take every one of the red numbers, put it over the blue one. Then I'll take every one of the red numbers and put it over the blue two. So here goes.
putting all of those over one. I bet you will have a lot of rep, uh, repeats here and some numbers we can discard. Then I take all of those red numbers and put them over. Now I'm putting the red numbers over. Put them all over the blue one. Now I'm going to put them all over here. The blue two. Yeah, it looks like some of these are going to simplify and be repeats. We can drop the over one. So here we go. I'm going to try to write it by possible rational zeros. That would be one, two, plus. There's a plus minus, but I'm not saying that every time just because it gets sort of tiring. So I have all of those. I'm up to this one here, one half. Do I already have one half listed? No, so I'll write it down. Two over two. That's one. Do I already have that listed? Yes. Yes, so I'll discard that one. Three over two. Do I already have it listed? Mm -hmm. So let's write it down. Six over two. Do I have that listed already? Six divided by two is three. Yeah, I have that listed. Nine over two. No, I don't have that one listed. Eighteen over two. Eight div eighteen divided by two is. Hmm. It's nine. We already have it. Here it is. Out of you say, oh, there's. A lot of numbers there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So out of infinitely many numbers, here are the 18 numbers that could possibly make this thing equal zero. And so this list having 18 numbers, remember the positive or negative, so you're counting it twice. So out of infinitely many numbers, 18 numbers, that could possibly make that function equal zero. I think that's pretty good. We've really narrowed it down. Now, just for the record, what's the maximum number of zeros we could possibly have? There are 18 possible, but in reality, there can no, there can't be more than how many? Hmm? It, yes. That one right, that biggest exponent, that says that's the maximum number of zeros possible. Max number of zeros. Any questions there? Oh, wait a minute, we didn't answer it, did we? Let's see. Remember the order doesn't matter. Just make sure that they have all of them. I think it's A, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But if you accidentally reversed those things, if you put, if you had put the leading coefficient first and then the uh, uh, constant term on the bottom, you would have incorrectly got response D, right? So remember, it's the constant that goes on top. That's why I write out the factors of the constant first. I want to see, oh, this one shouldn't be too bad, just 23 and 2. Y'all want to see another one, or do you think you've got the hang of it? Yes? Oh, goodness. Any questions before I stop recording? No.